my motto of I don't heal my patients, I teach them how to heal themselves is really born out of the idea that I'm not gatekeeping knowledge. I'm going to educate them and empower them and really show them the path so that they can take the steps towards their health. The reality is, is that doctor's offices is not where healing happens. That's where diagnosis happens. That is where treatment protocols are designed, not the place where actual healing is going to take place in a lot of cases. And especially when we talk about hormones, healing is going to come through, what are you putting in your grocery cart? I'm not going to be there for with you when you decide to get up at 6.30 a.m. and actually go for that morning walk and do that weightlifting routine. I'm not going to be there when you are like out to dinner and you say, I'm going to stop at one glass of wine. So why should I claim your wins? Why should I claim that I'm the one that healed you when in reality, it's you who got up and chose health every single day? Hi, I'm Kelly Namiro. Welcome to the Balancing Chaos podcast, a lifestyle podcast where we'll talk about wellness, motherhood, and some really exciting things in between. My goal is to help you develop a lifestyle that promotes health, wholeness, and success. Through my conversations with our experts and guests, I hope to inspire you to live a beautiful, full, and joyful life as you navigate balancing the chaos. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Balancing Chaos podcast today. I am so excited to have Dr. Jolene Brighton joining us on the show. Dr. Brighton is a renowned board-certified naturopathic endocrinologist, clinical sexologist, and a leading authority in women's medicine. Her dedication to empowering women to take control of their health and hormones has made her an inspiration to so many, including myself. With her extensive knowledge, best-selling books, Is This Normal, Beyond the Pill, and Healing Your Body Naturally After Childbirth, and other impact for work. Dr. Brighton continues to transform the lives of women worldwide. Welcome to the show, Dr. Brighton. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I'm super excited to have you on because truthfully of all of the people who I follow on Instagram and books that I've read and um, research I've done, there's so many hormone um, or women talking about hormones and doctors talking about hormones just these days. You are truly the person who aligns most with what I believe is possible for women when it comes to healing. And I just love your work so much. So thank you so much for being on the show. The first thing that I wanted to ask you, Dr. Brighton, is I think that, um, you know, when I was saying in the intro how much I admire you, I feel like your philosophy aligns so much with what I believe to be true about the potential for healing. Um, and one of your clinical models or your clinical motto, um, is I don't heal my patients. I teach them to heal themselves. And so I would love it if you elaborated a little bit on that philosophy and kind of talk our listeners, what that means to you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for those kind words. Um, you know, when you look at modern medicine, as we know it today in the United States, I think that it is very egotistical. It's a lot of humility, humility in listening to the patient, in believing their story, in understanding that even nutrition and lifestyle, we're just now seeing doctors starting to say, hey, nutrition and lifestyle actually does something. And yet for a very long time, that's even something where doctors would say, and some of them still do. Oh yeah, you can, you know, you ask them like, well, what if I eat this? Like, will that help? Oh, you can try it, but I'll see you back. Cause you know, nutrition doesn't do anything like the ego of of medicine to be like, yes, what humans have been doing since the dawn of time, that couldn't potentially have any impact on our health or health outcomes. So my motto of I don't heal my patients, I teach them how to heal themselves is really born out of the idea that I'm not gatekeeping knowledge. I'm going to educate them and empower them and really show them the path so that they can take the steps towards their health. The reality is, is that doctor's offices is not where healing happens. That's where diagnosis happens. That is where treatment protocols are designed. That is not the place where actual healing is going to take place in a lot of cases. And especially when we talk about hormones, healing is going to come through, what are you putting in your grocery cart? 
I'm not going to be there for with you when you decide to get up at 6.30 a.m. and actually go for that morning walk and do that weightlifting routine. I'm not going to be there when you are like out to dinner and you say, I'm going to stop at one glass of wine. Like I'm not there with you. So why should I claim your wins? Why should I claim that I'm the one that healed you when in reality, it's you who got up and chose health every single day? I love that. I love that so much. And I want to touch on what you kind of just brought up with a little bit of the gatekeeping. And I don't know if you would actually like coin this gatekeeping, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts about, cause I love your book beyond the pill. I love all of the information because there's so many women who are on it and just don't have the information. And I'm curious to what your thoughts are. Are doctors gatekeeping the information of the side effects and the potential things that can happen? I mean, I was on the pill for 11 years and I had no idea like dysbiosis, depression, all of these things that are potential side effects, or did they themselves not even really know? They don't know in a lot of cases. So they they get told one side, one story of the pill, the side effects to look out for. But the pill is tricky because the pill is a medication, but it was the first medication in the history of pharmaceuticals that you didn't have to have a diagnosis. You just had to have ovaries. If you were born with ovaries, you're a candidate. Great. We can give you the pill. Mm -hmm. And it comes with a highly, highly charged political tag to it, which this is part of the feminist movement. This is women's rights. This is women's liberty, you know, and, and all of that, that comes with it. And so to question it, especially if you were born with ovaries is to be a heretic, right? It is like, you're trying to move women behind. You are trying to hold women down. What a lot of these providers don't even realize is that the birth control trials themselves were highly exploitive. They exploited the women of Puerto Rico and when it was all said and done, that pill was never made available to them, even though they were told participate in the trials and we'll give you this reversible birth control. And instead, the pill trials are in the 50s. By the 1970s, the women of Puerto Rico suffered the highest rate of forced ster sterilization of any population ever. So this is not this whole concept that this pill has been all about women's liberation is a farce. It's not true. It is for certain women that it has liberated them. And we have to be honest in that discussion. So when it comes to these side effects, listen, if you work in gynecology, it's a compartment. You're in reproductive health. It's all the down there. If you work in gastroenterology, then it's the gut. We're going to talk about gut health. If you work in rheumatology, like so on and so forth, it's just all chopping up the body and designating mm -hmm. who's going to be a specialist. We need these specialists and... Your average gynecologist isn't trained in nutrition. Your average gynecologist doesn't get training extensively to understand the microbiome, the impacts of that. Your average gynecologist, they're not going to understand, you know, nutrient depletions and how to actually counsel diet. So when you see the nutrient depletions list with the pill, it's so funny because I start talking about this. I'm like one of the only doctors out there talking about it. I'm taking all this heat from gynecologists who are like, don't say anything critical of the pill. Then- I don't know, we we all collectively did our job because some of them started changing the narrative. And, and the next evolution was, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've known about those nutrient depletions since the 1970s. You've known about them? How many of you have counseled? So you knew about them, but you didn't think to tell your patient. And when I've called them on it, they're like, well, I just tell my patients eat a standard diet. Oh, the standard American diet, the most nutrient devoid one, the one that research says here, here, you know, if the, if there was a bar, the low bar, like it would be in hell. Like that's where it would be the standard American diet. And so you're not telling your patients to take a multivitamin or prenatal. No, that's just expensive urine. But what about if they're pregnant? Well, then if they're pregnant, then, then I tell them, I'm like, do not hear all the contradictions. It is so easy to say, listen, you're going to take this birth control pill. It has the potential to deplete vitamin C, vitamin E, your B vitamins, your minerals like magnesium, zinc, selenium, CoQ10. Let's get you on a quality prenatal or multivitamin just to add that extra layer, just the extra layer, because we're not all going to eat perfect every day. And to, to break it to the people who maybe don't know this, the nutrient optimal levels, they're very different. Feeling optimal in your body, those nutrient levels are very different than the recommended daily allowance, the minimum to not have disease. So I think this is something that's like so simple to talk to people about, and yet it's just not being done. Right. And there is also a lot of research that is not being done. 
for the fact that we've had this medication around this long and it hasn't had extensive research to really understand some of the big question marks, like what happens when you put a 14 year old on it and you leave her on it until she transitions into menopause and she never had an ovulatory cycle. We don't know. You ask your average doctor, they're going to say, there's no reason that you ever need to ovulate. There's no reason you need your natural progesterone. You talk to researchers about it and researchers are like, oh, hell no. That is a false statement to say because there is research to support the benefits of progesterone. The only way to progesterone is through ovulation. But also researchers that I speak with, they're like, listen, clinicians, the people who are working with patients are operating under this pretense that the absence of evidence means that there is evidence to support what they're saying. And that's just simply not true. We haven't had the studies there to tell us what's going on. So to your point, you know, the things I talk about in Beyond the Pill, I will say that I really stuck my neck out there and I took a lot of heat yeah. in coming out with that book and taking, uh, talking about all of these things. But I, and when you say gatekeeping, I'm like, this is something that's been gatekept way too long. I was past the pill. Women in my family passed the pill. So many patients passed the pill and told it doesn't cause depression. It doesn't cause anxiety. It doesn't cause any of these issues. Okay. So we don't have a study that says causation, but if the correlation is high enough and enough women are saying it, we have to question, but also what does any of that matter? If the person sitting in front of you says, I was fine. I started the pill. I'm not fine. Who cares about what a research study says? Help them. They're yeah. asking for help. Let's figure it out on the individual level. Oh, it's just like everything that you're saying is just so true. And I think that when, like, I even think about when I was given the pill, it was for acne when I was, I think, 15. 15 and or 16 and um you know that that specific doctor had told me at the time what exactly what you just said like there's really no reason you need to ovulate there's really no reason that you need to have that <clears throat> piece of your menstrual cycle until you're trying to get pregnant and mm -hmm. it's funny because i love my in-laws but my um mother-in-law is also an obgyn and she has said this because there it's the compartmentalization and like you were talking about, it's just not really like thought about until you put the whole piece of the body together or all pieces of the body together. And it's this holistic thing where you're looking at it and you're like, oh, ovulation gives you progesterone, progesterone makes you feel X, Y, and Z. So just really quickly before we move on, can you tell our listeners, because I have a lot of clients who are kind of resistant to getting off of the pill. They're like, oh no, my doctor says it's fine. But then we talk about all their symptoms and I'm like, but you had ovulating would make you feel so much better. Um, so yeah. tell us <laughs> what that does for the female body and what, the, what the benefits are. Okay. So, you know, if you want to stay on the pill, that's totally your prerogative. And this is yeah. where I really like to support people. If you want to stay on the pill, let's make sure that we've got your diet dialed in. We've got your new nutrients coming in. We are taking a probiotic, eating our prebiotics, like doing all of the things to mitigate the side effects of it. However, we can't deny that there is absolutely no progesterone in the pill. So the combination pill or the progestin only, which is progestin. I want people to understand this because doctors will often say like, oh yeah, well, it's progesterone. It can't be. It can't be. You cannot patent a drug that is natural. So you can't patent progesterone. You can patent progestin. Progestin yeah doesn't have the same, it's not the same molecule. So you just look at it. It's not the same molecule. It doesn't have the same benefits of progesterone. So progesterone gets metabolized. So I want everyone to understand this first. You ovulate. Only after ovulation is a temporary endocrine structure known as the corpus luteum that is formed in the ovary will produce progesterone. Your luteinizing hormone for the brain will be cheering it on, rooting, coming in, being like, keep going, make that progesterone that is going to carry you through your luteal phase. If fertilization has happened of your egg, an embryo implants several days later, that will produce HCG. Now HCG becomes the cheerleader of the corpus luteum until the placenta can take over. So people just understand like where, how are we getting progesterone? Now progesterone, when it's metabolized, it, its metabolites will affect the GABA receptor in your brain. So GABA is chill out, calm down, stop being so anxious. Let's just like not panic. Yeah. So it's going to stimulate the GABA receptor. You're going to feel 
more in love, more connected with people in your life. You're going to feel calmer. You're going to sleep better at night. If somebody has low progesterone, I know it because they're like several days before my period, I'm feeling anxious or I'm more nervous. I've got nervous energy. I'm That's going cute. to bed at night. My thoughts are racing. I'm tossing and turning. Maybe they're even waking up in the middle of the night. And so progesterone has a lot of benefits. You know, I was talking with Dr. Lisa Moscone, who is a researcher. She wrote the book, Menopause Brain. And she and I were talking about how just even progesterone is part of the myelin sheath and how so many of these providers get it wrong with progestin thinking you don't need any progesterone because you've got progestin. Well, we call them sex hormones, they are, there are receptors throughout your entire body for these hormones and your brain health is contingent on these hormones. So it is a huge question that we have of what happens to brain development. Your brain does not finish maturing until 25 years of age. Most of us are being put on the pill before the nervous system makes that complete maturation happen. And we need, we rely on these hormones for that. Why? Do we do that without ever questioning how could this be impacting our nervous system, our brain health, our longevity? Mm-hmm. Why Why do we continue to do that? And again, it comes through, well, let me just say this because we haven't touched on this. Why do doctors say that women don't need to ovulate? Because men don't ovulate. And mm-hmm. men are who we've studied. It was not until the 90s, okay, I was like, I already have my period. And then they were like, we're going to mandate this. We're going to say that like you have to include women in clinical trials. It wasn't until 2024 that a president was like, we are going to put a major initiative into studying women's health. Like we're going to actually like really invest in this. I want people to understand that men have always been centered in women's medicine. Mm. Okay. They have always been centered. Even how much sleep we need based on a man. Yeah. Like so much of the data is based on men. And then we're told, well, you're just the inferior version with baby making accessories. So you should be more like them. A libido. Why does, why, when we talk about a libido, is everybody like, oh, testosterone, men, estrogen is actually really important in women's libido, but it goes back to men. When women are told they have low libido, why? Because it's being compared to men. So much of us is being compared to men. They do a trial in men and they think same, same for us. And what research shows time and again, it's not, it's not the same. And we do have to ask questions specific to women. We, if you do research and it's critical of the pill, you might not get more funding because you will be just ostracized for that. And in addition, we have constant centering of the male body. And that is where this, you don't need to ovulate comes from. Or they're like, well, when you're pregnant, you don't ovulate. Therefore you don't need, what, I, do much progesterone I'm swimming in when I'm pregnant? Like, no, no, absolutely not. I love what you brought up because I even think of like, and I've seen you talk about this on your Instagram, intermittent fasting and how all of that research, because there's some people that it's good for, some people that it's not good for, but I think that when the, it first came out, everybody jumped on that bandwagon because all of the testing was done on men. And then yeah. come to find out like a little bit down the road that some women are having disrupted menstrual cycles from doing it. Some women, it's like, it's so crazy, but our bodies are just more delicate than. Uh, they are not more delicate. They are like by, by design more sensitive to the environment because you have the capacity to gestate and cultivate human life. Babies are expensive to make. They are very expensive, very taxing on your body. They are very noisy creatures. Okay. Breastfeeding is even more expensive from a nutrient standpoint and they're very noisy. So if there's a predator around, that's a bad idea. Your body is wise. It's not delicate. It's not inferior. It is wise in that it's like, we have to be very in tune to the environment. Why would you lose your period with intermittent fasting? It's a stressor. Just like cold plunges are a stressor. There are all kinds of really good stressors, but if you're already under stress or you push it too far, you can lose your period. So if you're postmenopausal, you can fast like a man right? You can fast like a man because you're no longer cyclical. You're no longer depending on ovulation to get to progesterone. You're probably taking bioidentical progesterone or oral micronized progesterone. Like you, you're not, it's not the same as being in that reproductive window. And this is something that whenever people are like, oh, like intermittent fasting, this like, you know, 
It's just this new trend. It is not a new trend. I have used intermittent fasting with my patients for well over a decade. And one of the number one conditions I use it with is with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, gut dysfunction. And here, I'm gonna tell you why. When I say intermittent fasting, it is a 12 hour fast. People will be like, yeah, well, that's just called like eating dinner at night and like, you know, waking up eating breakfast. <laughs> I think it's still intermittent fasting and spend some time in a closed room with people being honest, cultivate that trust. And people will tell you they snack right up until the time they close their eyes. And their dentist is like, yeah, no, I can see it in their teeth. Like stop doing that people. So they, why do we fast 12 hours? This is so, so important. Fasting 12 hours gives the migrating motor complex. So what is basically the street sweeper of your intestine. So it's going to push through everything about four cycles. You want to be fasting while you sleep because that is going to help your gut do its job in the evening. Then you get your morning bowel movement. Fantastic. So if you're not having a morning bowel movement, there might be some gut dysfunction. If you depend on coffee or magnesium to get there, we've got some gut dysfunction. And I want people to understand if you cannot make it through a 12 hour fast, we've got hormone issues going on. It could be insulin, but it could also be cortisol. And in those instances, this is where like in Beyond the Pill, I talk about the golden milk latte. I swear, like I actually just drank this. Um, this was like a couple of weeks ago. And for whatever reason, we were getting ready for bed and I could feel my blood sugar dropping. Well, okay, for whatever reason, it's because progesterone. I was in my luteal phase. Progesterone raises your caloric needs and you are a little bit less insulin sensitive. So I felt this. So what did I do? I was like, I'm going to go down. I just mixed up some golden milk. I used some heavy cream in it. I used some collagen in it. I actually didn't use, I talk about like you can use some honey in it. I didn't do that because that I don't actually even like it. That I don't like it that sweet. I don't like sweet food. And that's, I drank that like, uh, that was about like an hour before bed, but I could just feel that I was like, I'm hungry and I don't want disrupted sleep for anything. And so if you are someone who's like, I can't get through a 12 hour fast and that's consistent, then we want to look at like, well, what are you eating for dinner? Like we, we go backwards. What are you eating for dinner? What are you eating for lunch? Let's go to breakfast. And we want to optimize our meals, but we also want to ask the question, do we have cortisol and insulin dysregulation? Because that'll wake you up at night. And if you wake up and you're feeling hot and sweaty, but you're also kind of angry and you're hungry then that is pointing to cortisol. If you wake up hot and sweaty, you're insul you're, it's not so much insulin and cortisol. That's that's your estrogen. That's what we expect in perimenopause. Okay. I have, I have so many questions um, because- <laughs> I know I just dropped so much there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I feel like so many of my listeners are in that perimenopausal stage. So I want to go there next. But before we do that, I actually had someone send me a message uh, last week asking me, you know, National Geographic is saying that cortisol imbalances aren't real. And as somebody who personally like knows how it feels to go through a cortisol imbalance, um, my story is I had a horrible eating disorder. I was a crazy stressed person and my period went missing. My thyroid was dysfunctional, all things. And a lot of it had to do with the cascade downstream effects of, of chronic stress. And so I would love it if you could talk a little bit about that, like cortisol and insulin, if they're disrupted, how they can impact all of the other hormones, kind of what you were just saying. Yeah. I haven't seen that, but, uh, can we make elephants great again, <laughs> like great content? Because I feel like national geographic is kind of stepping out of their lane and they've been <laughs> publishing very contrary and stuff. And sometimes it just sounds stupid to me that like you would drag women um, who say they have a hormone imbalance and then you have all these doctors being like, hormone imbalance isn't real unless you have PCOS. Then you have an insulin and testosterone imbalance. Oh, unless you have hypothyroidism, then you have a thyroid imbalance. And I'm like, so hormone imbalances are real and stop putting the burden on the patient to identify exactly what they're feeling. If a patient comes to me and says, I have a hormone imbalance, I say, tell me more. Tell me more about that. What makes you use that term? It's my job to investigate and figure out what hormone are they talking about? And then there's the like, oh, they just blanketly say everything helps your hormones like, and that helps balance your hormones. Yes, sleep balances your hormones. Eating fiber, fat, and protein with every meal balances your hormones. Which hormones? All of the hormones. That's why you can use it like that. 
So um, talking about cortisol and insulin, those are the foundation of your hormones. I like to talk about that hierarchy and I have the pyramid that's in, is this normal? And I show cortisol and insulin are really the foundation. If those are off kilter, every single hormone, your, your thyroid's going to fill it, your sex hormones are going to fill it, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you're going to chase those down because you're going to be like, I don't feel good. I want to chase those down. And yet you have to work on that foundation as well. So that's just one example of how cortisol can shift those things. If you're a woman with PCOS and you have elevated insulin, that stimulates the ovaries to make more testosterone. If we've got more inflammation, testosterone is gonna, gonna shift into estrogen. Well, who's the hormone that controls inflammation? Cortisol. Cortisol is supposed to come in and help dampen inflammation. It's not all bad. It's actually a very good thing. But every every hormone's a good thing until it's not, until you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm dealing with a problem here. So this idea, you know, I I will give them if they, I didn't read the article, but if they're talking about how adrenal fatigue and like, this is not a thing, sure. But right. if they're trying to dismiss the, uh, let me, I'm going to explain that further. People are like WTF. Okay. Uh, but if they're trying to dismiss this concept of burnout, that's well-documented. If they're trying to dismiss this concept of HPA dysregulation, that's hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access that is well documented in the research as well. So cortisol imbalances do absolutely exist, but the concept of adrenal fatigue, which again, a patient can say that, that's their prerogative, shaming them, blaming them for not knowing correct terminology or dismissing them because you have some stigma against it. Like, bro, what are you doing with your life? Like you're supposed to help people. So with that, if somebody says to me, like, I think I have adrenal fatigue, I will educate them about what's going on. Adrenal fatigue is this concept that, you know, the names kind of, it doesn't make sense because it says in itself that the adrenals are getting fatigued and they're going to quit. Uh, perimenopause, your ovaries are going to quit. Like they're going to quit. Sometimes it's going to feel like they walked out on you, but they're retiring. They're like, you know, they're slowing down. Like, you know, when someone's got one foot out the door at the company and they're only <laughs> doing half their work, that's perimenopause. That's transitioning to menopause. Those are going to quit, but your adrenal glands, they don't. And so what actually happens is the brain will die on regulate cortisol production sometimes, or cortisol's been too high. When cortisol's too high, we age at a cellular level. That's a bad thing. We kill brain cells. That's a bad thing. You don't need me to tell you a bad thing. Like, you know this, you, you, you intuitively know this. And so the body being really wise will also be like, you know, these receptors we have, the cells are like, we're not going to accept your message today, cortisol. Thank you. No. Uh, and then there's also enzymes that will get upregulated. So it's like, we're going to push this into cortisone. So we're going to keep you safe. And then what ultimately happens is we end up with symptoms of low cortisol, but as I explain, and is this normal? And I give you a whole protocol on how to address high and low cortisol. But what we now understand is that the symptoms of low cortisol, they're not usually truly low cortisol, unless this is Addison's disease, which I really hope they mention that 21 hydroxylase antibodies flag in that uh, adrenal gland for destruction in your immune system coming in. That is real. That is yeah. very real. And that is the time that your adrenals will quit. Yeah. And they, I did read the article. They do mention that, but you're, you're, you're you were dead on. They talk about, you know, <clears throat> burnout and adrenal fatigue and how those things are not necessarily real. And there, I love that you made the distinction of there is a difference between HPA axis dysfunction and the term that you hear all these influencers or people saying online adrenal fatigue because your adrenals are not actually fatigued. And so just educating people and letting them know what's actually happening in their body is so empowering because then they can figure out what the next right step in the correct direction is, which I love. Um, missing burnout, it just feels like gaslighting women into staying totally. productive in a capitalistic society and not honoring and recognizing the fact that we are in such a unique time as women where we are hustling, we are working, and we're often caretaking children. And the generation of like elder millennials and Gen X are sandwiched between caretaking their parents and caretaking children. And there is a mental health crisis happening in perimenopause. We see astronomical rates of depression and anxiety. And so much of this stems from the way society has done us dirty. And so to be like, oh, there's no burnout, to that, I'm just like, why don't you talk to the women who are now being diagnosed as neurodivergent for the first time in their life? Girl. The women with ADHD or autism who have been masking, who have been putting on that smile, who have been getting by, and who are completely burning out and shutting down, and we can actually measure their numbers. Like, 
Yeah. Well done, National Geographic. Did you actually do something like positive in this world? Because I love National Geographic. So I'm really like upset with them right now <laughs> that I'm like, what is this like newfound interest in like perpetuating the like awful narrative that women have been fighting against? Like, I feel like with the rise of social media is the first time where women could collectively tell their stories and no longer get gaslit by their doctors who are like, no one else experiences, just you. And they actually could connect. And what I think is so important for everyone listening, always share your stories to the extent that you're comfortable because that you don't know whose life you're going to change, but you also never know whose doctor has beaten it out of them verbally that that healing is not possible. And you become an example of what's possible. When people can see, they can see the path, they can see the destination, they understand that there is another way, they can be just moving mountains in their life. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and I feel like you do that so well, by the way, like all of the things that you share from your fertility journey to some of the things that you're like eating and, and cooking. It's just like, you do that so well to share with women, how to just make these small changes that can really improve their life based on what you're going through or have been through. So I truly appreciate that. Hi, I'm Kelly Namiro, your host, certified holistic hormone coach and Pilates instructor for the WBK method. You can consider me your guide in helping you curate the very best version of yourself from the inside out feeling physically better by optimizing your hormones to feeling mentally and emotionally better by creating a more deep and grounded connection with yourself. I get questions all the time in my DMs about things like, what supplements should I be taking for my menopause symptoms? Or is it normal that I'm always exhausted? My doctor said that's what happens as I get older. Or maybe I gained 20 pounds in the last couple of years and I have no idea how to lose it. And even I'm chronically bloated and I've tried every elimination diet. Please help. But here's the thing. There are no quick fixes out there. Until you know the root cause of what's going on in your body and you use precision supplementation, a targeted diet, and mindset and lifestyle changes that are specific to your unique circumstances and lab values, you're never going to be able to heal. Throwing just random supplements that make all these promises or a restrictive diet at a weight issue is never going to work because it's not focused on what's going on internally with you. And often we can make the problem worse when we do these things. And that's why I've created the WBK lab review package. In this package, you'll receive lab kits and a custom lab form based on your symptoms and health history. Once you've completed the saliva kit for your adrenals, the stool kit for your gut health, and the blood tests for your hormones and other health markers, we'll sit down together and create a customized plan that will help you balance your hormones in a holistic way so that you can lose weight, have more energy, maintain a balanced mood, and achieve the results that you've been wanting. This year, it is time to get the results that you've been dreaming of because you're targeting your unique system. If you're ready to experience more energy, comfort, confidence in your body, and relief from those nagging symptoms that have been bringing you down, I would love to support you in doing just that. This program includes a one-on-one call between you and me, all of the labs needed to create your customized protocol, and a PDF with your unique plan that you'll be following going forward so that you can take your time in implementing your new diet, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more about this, head to the link in the show notes or go to wellnessbykelly.com to to learn more about the WBK lab review. I do want to dive into the topic of what we're saying. You were saying about perimenopause. I'm curious to your thoughts because of how society does have these expectations and pressures on women, right? We're in this hustle culture where like you're saying, we're also like caretakers or mothers or whatever the case may be. Um, Maybe you're taking care of parents and kids at the same time. Do you feel like that has an impact on people's symptoms in terms of making them worse than they may have ever been before, whether that's the irritability, the depression, um, the weight gain. That's the one I hear probably the most. I've gained weight and I feel like nothing I'm doing is working. There are so many things that women in their even late thirties and up to, you know, their late forties come to me saying, so I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, absolutely. The stress and the pressures and the things that we are going through, they're going to affect our hormones. They're going to amplify things. We also live in, you know, as of right now, it's like the most toxic time ever to be on the planet. And what's sad is that in 10 years, I'll be able to still say that it's not going to likely get better because 
we're not going to hold corporations accountable. I feel kind of like, wah, wah, but it's not happening. And so the other thing to understand is that your body has a huge environmental toxin burden, no matter where you're living in the world. And depending on where you're living, it could be worse. And I feel like every day more comes out and we're like, oh my gosh, now that like forever chemicals and my sports bra is dangerous. And like, there's just so much stuff. And so this is where, you know, in Is This Normal, I give you lots of tips and things to support your own detox system, to make sure that you are limiting your exposure. You control what you can, support your detox for when you can't. That is the best way to navigate things. And so especially if you're getting hit with environmental toxins, these contain things like xenoestrogens, endocrine disruptors that are going to either stimulate your cells, misbehave, or they're going to block the receptors so you can't dock your hormones, or they're going to downregulate your own hormone production, actually affecting the glands so they don't produce hormones like they should. And we understand these environmental toxins, they do prematurely age the ovaries and cause oxidative stress. So it's going to impact our fertility. But even if you never want to have a baby, I want you to understand that you want to be as fertile as long as possible, because that is how you bathe in these wonderful hormones that protect your heart, your brain, your bones, they protect you for life. And I want to validate that if you are in perimenopause and you're gaining weight and you're feeling like you can't do anything to lose it, this is real. Because as you lose estrogen, you lose insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. As you lose estrogen, your joints hurt more. Recovery is harder. As you lose estrogen, dopamine and serotonin are not there to motivate you to want to work out. And so I see people, why is it always got to be like the 20 something, like the young 20 something in the gym, <laughs> little gym bunny action going on. This was me. I was like 20 something in the gym, but um, always criticizing perimenopause and menopausal women and being like, it's just because you're lazy and you're eating so much and you're not working out. Like stop saying it's your hormones. And I'm like, oi. Like, I hate to break it to you, but shit's going to be so hard for you. Like, you should have never said what you said because the universe is like, I'm karma. Gonna <laughs> I'm going to keep note of that. I'm coming for you. TikTok lady, you got like 20 years. I'm going to get you. Like, no, like, perimenopause is going to be staring you down. So just like bridle yourself. <laughs> Calm down. And also like, stop being so like disrespectful really in that you know so little about life. Why don't you listen to women who are coming before you? This is something that I'm so grateful. Like I remember being in like my 20s and like listening to patients and just being like, yes, I'm okay, note to self, note to self. And just being like, these women have so much wisdom. And I like, I, I even say to my husband now, like I'm 43, I probably won't go into menopause. Like, you know, it's going to be probably like 51 is the average. I, and just knowing my family history and everything, it's probably going to be around them maybe later. But I told him even now I'm in training for menopause. Like I am like, you know, I lift now. This is to keep my muscle mass. I wear a weighted vest on my walking desk. I am building my bone mass. I will optimize. And I'm like, I'm literally training for this. I think that if you listen to the women who have come before you, you can get the tips and the insider tricks to start training for that so that you, and, and let me say, everything that you do today for tomorrow makes today even better. So like you win all around. So what do we do though, right? With weight gain, because everybody's going to be like, this is great, rah, rah, rah. Can you just tell me what to do about this? Okay, so <laughs> firstly, you got to sleep. You have to sleep. And you got to sleep like eight hours, maybe nine hours. Like it's got, it's got to be like, more than what you were getting by on before. So it can't be six or seven. You have to get quality sleep. You absolutely will never liberate any body fat as long as your body thinks you're not safe. Lack of sleep is a stressor and it can it can amplify insulin resistance even more. So definitely, definitely sleep. Get your fiber up. 25 grams every single day. If you're not doing it now, you're gonna increase by five grams a week until you get there. You're gonna eat five more grams every single day for a week, then go another five grams. Cause if you're doing five now and you jump to 25 tomorrow, I'm gonna get a DM of you being like, I can't poop and I hate you. So don't <laughs> do that, okay? Or you're like, I seriously just farted in the elevator. I couldn't hold it in because my microbiome is changing for the better. Yeah. But as insulin, it, it, yeah, excuse me, as estrogen declines, microbial diversity declines in the gut as well. And we've seen from research, those who have more microbial diversity 
have less belly fat. Those who are feeding those microbes and have more fiber coming in, less belly fat. Why does belly fat matter? Because when I say belly fat, I'm not talking like on the surface, cute little muffin top. If you do have a muffin top, no, you have fat around your organs. Now you're at increased risk. I could care less what the number on the scale says. If you've got low muscle mass and high visceral adiposity, friends, you're going to get diabetes. You are going to have a heart attack. You are going to have a stroke. You're going to have bad stuff in your 60s, 70s, 80s. So let's not do that. So get your fiber up now. Making that shift. So, and fiber is also going to keep you full. Yes, yes. It's going to be like helping so that you eat less, but I don't like to focus on eat less. I like to focus on nutrient density because if you're eating 30 grams of protein with each meal, you're making sure you get that 25 grams of fiber every day. You're going to find there's not a lot of room for all the other stuff that people are like, avoid this, avoid that, avoid this. Instead of focusing on what to avoid, let's focus on what to bring in that actually nourishes our body. And what you'll find is, is that cravings do start to shift and go away. Um, you know, I like to use things like bioinositol when people are having cravings, insulin dysregulation, a lot of research done with PCOS actually can be really helpful in perimenopause. And so um, that's one that I like to use. I also, uh, so my myoinositol plus also has chromium in it. That's a mineral that can help with insulin yeah. even more. So I like to use, I'm always like, let's use a combination formula of like the good stuff. Uh, it also has like green tea extract because that helps you keep your hair on your head. And we want that too. Uh, so we want to bring in those things that, and green tea extract, non-caffeinated, this is a great way to also support ovarian health. And so, um, this is like the dietary pieces. I want to say 25, 25, 25 grams of fiber, no more than 25 grams of added sugar. And you are going to be gobsmacked when you start reading labels. I teach my kids to read labels and they know that they can't go over 25. If they come to Costco with me and they're cool and like we get through that, I'm like, you guys can pick one thing to have in the pantry, one treat to have in the pantry. The way they will look at like even the gluten-free, like, you know, Bobo's peanut butter and jelly. And my kid's like, wait, that's 16 grams of sugar. That means that like, I, I get nine, I get only nine. And so like, if I wanted to have like a fruit leather, I couldn't have that. And he's just like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Not worth it. Not worth it. And they don't come from it from a place of like, oh, you know, sugar is addictive and it's bad. And they come from a place of like, that's not good for your microbiome. That's not good for your brain health. That's not like, we don't want to bring this in because then we struggle with like behavior. We struggle with being able to be with our friends. We struggle with co concentration. Like my 11 year old has uh, a condition called pandas. And so we have to be, you know, people are, I sometimes get messages from people that are like, you're so strict with your kid's diet and he's going to have food issues. And I'm like, except that he has gone and uh, FAFO with like Doritos at a party or has been like, I'm just going to eat the candy. And he comes home with a blue mouth. He can't sleep at night. He's agitated. He's crying. The next morning, is he's up at like 4.30 in the morning pacing. He's like, I don't feel good in my body. He is very sensitive and it affects him. And so I say to like, when people are like that, I'm like, man, if you literally see your child suffering and you know sugar is the problem and these artificial things, like why? Like, right. I don't like seeing him like that. It breaks my heart. So anyhow, but back to perimenopause, sugar, you gotta watch it, get your fiber up. And then in terms of exercise, I challenge my patients to lift weights and not like, not like you don't have to be extreme heavy or anything. You can actually, if you, if you go lighter and you spend more time in the full movement, sometimes it's, <laughs> I've done that. I'm like, it's sometimes worse. That's what I did this That's weekend. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh God, everything burns so bad. And like, I can't go up the stairs. I have a four story house. Like what the heck? <laughs> so um, the other thing is walking challenging you to walk more and 10,000 steps is like, yeah, the research, like, what is that even based on? It's still just, it's good for people to have goals and to know that like Benchmark, even yes. two minutes of movement has a positive impact. Even, even, you know, 10 minutes of walking has a positive impact, but trying strength training and walking, because that is going to help with insulin and cortisol. So I said a whole lot. I hope this helps people. You let us know in the comments, do you like actionable yes. tips? <laughs> I, I love the actionable tips because I think that they're, especially the ones that you gave around like the sugar because I, and the fiber, because I feel like, 
I mean, I know that most Americans are not getting enough fiber. I know that most Americans are eating too much sugar and to have like numbers associated with it really helps people to process that. One question that I do have that I know we'll get after this specific conversation is how much protein? Yeah. So it's got to be at least one gram per kilogram of body weight, especially if you're in perimenopause. And then if you strength train, you need to go even higher. And that might be more like 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. And that's your ideal body weight. That's not, you weigh 150 and you want to be 140. We would set it at 140 and aim aim for where you want to be at. And I just want everybody listening to know that if you jump into eating high protein right away, your microbiome is going to change. And with that, you might get changes in like having gas, feeling maybe bloated, maybe having some constipation, maybe feeling like bowel movements are a little more loose. Like you can see these changes if it persists like more than, you know, three days, then we got to be like, okay, what's, what's going on. That's why we always want to go gradual with things. Because if you have those kinds of symptoms, you're going to be like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? And also this is uncomfortable. Why would I want to keep doing this? So I actually, um, I think 25 to 30 grams of protein for breakfast is a good aim for most women. I have articles and resources at drbrighton.com on like how to get 30 grams of protein with recipes for breakfast, best breakfast for hormones, how much protein do women need? Like we put out these articles to really help people and they're evidence-based. And I like to provide that guidance. So if you see the way I structure my plates, like the reason I've been sharing, it's so funny that my mother-in-law was talking about this where she was like telling a friend because I was there taking a photo of the food and she's like, people that like are really interested in what she eats. I'm like, yeah, it turns out that when you're a hormone expert and you have a nutrition science degree and you've spent your whole like adult life basically like structuring your plate in a certain way, people are really interested in that. So I like to have at least half the plate and I actually structure a plate in, um, is this normal and like talk through how, what it should look like. So half the plate being plants. So vegetables and fruits. I am not one of those people. Listen, you want to eat one to two pieces of fruit a day. That is not the thing that is going to make you fat. I want people to understand that. Banana is not good. No. And so, you know, this is the way it like gets me is you got like, you got like all of these people that like, so seed oils, not great. Okay. Not great. We want to minimize those. The whole seed, that's different. We've got people being like seed oils are bad. Therefore eating seeds are bad, you know? And, and then you've got people that are like tomatoes are bad. You should never eat tomatoes. And then you got people that are like, no one should eat fruit. Fruit is bad. And I'm like, look, the majority of chronic disease that people are experiencing in the United States is coming from ultra processed food. And you're going to come out here and you're going to act like whole foods are somehow the problem. <laughs> the research says no to you. And secondly, what the hell are people going to eat? If you're literally villainizing everything, if everything's been vilified, what are they going to eat? Like, stop this. And, and, and it's not, it's not sexy. Okay. And it's not catchy. And it's not going to get the clicks and the algorithm's not going to favor it. When I come out and say like, yeah, what the two pieces of fruit a day is reasonable and half your plate in vegetables. If I'm being like level-headed, that's not what gives the click. So if you're someone who's like, why is all this like garbage? It's garbage. Okay. This information, but like, why is this getting put in front of me? Cause like it gets the clicks. The algorithm's like, hey, this will probably piss you off too. So let me put this in front of you. So um, <laughs> half the plate is plants. Cut the other in half. So now we've got, you know, a quarter, quarter. And so with that, we want to have our protein. And then we want to have what is going to be our source of carbohydrates. This is also gets really controversial because people see my plate and I don't eat a lot of grains. I just don't eat a lot of grains. They don't do well with my body. I'm someone who has multiple autoimmune conditions that has put them in remission. And one of the things I've learned is grains just like a lot of grains don't work for me and they never have. And that is my body. So if your plate is going to look like a quarter of that is going to be like some oats or you want to bring in like some quinoa, like if that's where like that feels good for your body, respect that. And maybe that carbohydrate is instead going to be Ooh, cold potatoes, cook your potatoes, cool them. Now you've got resistant starch. Now your microbiome is like, yeah, friend. Or maybe it's going to be like, you know, you're going to do uh, smash plantains or you're going to do sweet potatoes or something else. And then we, but we always want to make sure we've got that protein. And then somehow you're going to bring fat 
into all of that. And that's roughly how we want to be structuring our plate. To the fruit conversation, if you are consuming more than 25 grams of sugar, if you're eating, oh, oh my gosh, I saw something about like, it was um some study that came through and it was like, oh yeah, like it turns out like this thing's a problem if somebody's drinking three liters of soda a day. I didn't even pay it any mind like what, what they were even talking about because I was just like three liters. Like what about water? Like, wait a minute. So like, I, and it's so funny. Cause I'm like, sure people are interested. I'm like, that would have been a really cool thing to make me sound smart and drop that. I don't even remember what the study was about. Cause I was just taken back like, how much <laughs> soda was being consumed. I'm like, how are you drinking water? Where's the water? Like I drink three, like, you, but you're peeing all the time. Your kidneys. <laughs> like, I just had so many questions. So with that though, if you are drinking a lot of soda, you're consuming a lot of high fructose corn syrup, you have like your liver is already overburdened by all of this. Fruit will be a problem for you. But is fruit the thing? Was fruit the problem? No. No, no fruit wasn't the problem. It just became problematic because the system was overloaded. It's just like if you are already drinking plenty of water a day, adding a whole lot another, like get like adding a, you know, a second gallon of water. That's going to be a problem. Is it because water is the problem? No, it's because of the habit. It's because of everything else going on in this system. So if people were to implement, even just like, let's say, let's say they implemented all of the things that you just said, and it's somebody in perimenopause, how long does it take for somebody to notice the impact of these changes? Because I think that so many people are so used to, I take a pill, I feel immediate relief. How long does it take to start for our hormones to start to actually rebalance once we implement real lifestyle changes? Oh gosh. So if you're still cycling, this is the thing that like, I always set people up and nobody loves it when I say it, but let's like tell the truth to people. So what you do today is for your future cycle, not the cycle you're in. So whatever you do today, you can't expect it's going to completely turn things around. So let's say you start on day 10 of your cycle, come day 28, you're not going to have turned around all those period pain, period issues that you're having. You are doing it for your future cycle and things should progressively improve, but it takes like a good three months to really notice. And that's why I tell people track. Track everything because you'll stay motivated when you're seeing the change. But usually when people start with their initial symptoms and then they look at three months later, they're like, wow, a lot has changed. Now, in general, like I have to just say, it depends on what's going on, right? Like if you've got insulin resistance and you've got, you know, high levels of inflammation, like it's a complex kind of hormonal situation, it could take you longer to where you, to feel better, but your hormones will start shifting. And that's what's cool is like the microbiome. That's why I'm like, if you eat protein, if you increase your fiber, you're going to feel that. That's because the microbiome can shift in 24 hours with dietary changes. So know that if you went binge drinking friends and you decimated your microbiome, uh, you can turn that around. You can turn that around in over the next week by how, how you're, and I'm not endorsing binge drinking, but I just think it's important that um, we never adopt this mindset of like, it's all or nothing. And people will say things like, I fell off the wagon. I really like that. There's no real wagon, right? There's like, it's like the cha-cha, right? Sometimes it's like two steps forward, two steps back. Like we're just like doing a little dance here. And I just want people to understand that like, if you do end up like going out with your girlfriends and you're like, I don't know how one mimosa turned into five, but it happened. Don't then take that and just be like, so forget None. it. I'm going to, I'm going to binge eat like this cake. I'm going to just give up on all this stuff. Like, no, you had a human experience. Welcome to being a human. This is what we came for. You had a human experience. And when patients will tell me something like that, I'm like, did you have fun with your friends? They're like, yes. I'm like, did you have a hangover? Yes. Okay. Well, we didn't like the hangover, but we liked the fun with the friends. So let's just like hang on to the fun with the friends and let's talk about some strategies in the future. So that doesn't happen. Like drinking water between each drink, maybe taking charcoal with you <laughs> so that just in case you can like buffer against that. Like we come up with strategies. It does no one any good to feel shame, to feel judgment, whether it's coming from yourself or someone else. And uh, I think Brene Brown, man, like more people should read her work uh, because amazing. Like, her research is amazing. And it tells us like, I actually saw someone who I really like on social media, but I really didn't like this post. And he put up like saying like, what happened to good old shame? Because it seems like in 2020, we were doing a really good job shaming people. And that was effective and yeah. changing behavior. And I was like, 
that is not effective in changing behavior. All it's effective in is making sure people mask it from you and they're still who they are. And like, it's okay to like make mistakes and then be forgiven for those mistakes when you recognize them and you're like, oh yeah, like I messed up. And that's something that like, I, you know, I think, um, like we, you know, with our kids, we'll just be like, you know, if you like, you can just call a timeout, like call timeout. And that's just a signal of like, I need a calm parent who's not going to lose their mind. Cause I just messed up really bad. And let's have a conversation about it. Call timeout with yourself. I'm asking for me to be gentle and I'm just going to examine this and I'm going to look at like, okay, what is going on? And I want you to also be gentle with your body and in the change. If you've never strength trained or build muscle mass and you're starting perimenopause, it will be harder. You will not get the gains that like the like 20 something girl gets. But if you stick with it in three months time, you are going to change your body composition. And that's the goal. Not what size clothes you fit in, not how you look in your clothes. Although I like want all that for you too. I want you to be like, yeah, shopping spree because I feel so good in my body. But your body composition that you're building bone density, you're building muscle mass, that is going to optimize your hormones. And so I think as we get into perimenopause, we have to cling a little more tightly to the things that truly matter. And that's the beauty of getting into your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. You get perspective on what truly matters. And while your 20-something-year-old self may have been trying to shrink as much as possible because the world said smaller is better, take up less space and be quiet and make sure you always smile. And you are like, I will comply. I will do this thing. Your 40-year-old self is going to be like, I'm going to own this body I live in. I am going to train for my future self. Self and so that every day I can feel my best. And you've got to find the things that motivate you outside of the aesthetics. And I hate to be the one to say this because like, I also struggle with this as well, but like, you're not going to look like this forever. Your skin is going to sag. It is going to age. Things are going to change. That is the season of the life. And that is a well-lived life. If you are blessed to live long enough, that is what your body will experience and go through. But unlike we saw, you know, the, the archetype in the past where people were like in their 60s and frail, we now have inspiration. We've now got 60 year olds who are like shredded and killing it. And like, you know, they're out there playing with their grandkids if they want to play with their grandkids. They're they're running marathons. They are kayaking like they are doing the things that they love that bring them joy. And so that's the last piece I would say when it comes to exercise Get hobbies that are movement. Get hobbies that are movement. Whether it's hiking, whether you, you want to get your progesterone up, walk with a friend or a couple of friends. Community builds progesterone. Community helps your progesterone. It's going to help your cortisol and you're going to have an activity. I'm someone who loves to snorkel. I actually share this on the spot on a podcast with a male host. And he was like, oh yeah, snorkeling, but you're just floating in the water. I'm like, I'm open ocean snorkeling, okay? So like I'm swimming against waves. I am diving down like, you know, because like if there's a lionfish, I'm gonna get in your face. I got <laughs> you. If there's a puffer, like these are things that I'm like, I'm gonna get close, not too close. But like, you know, that's something I'm like, I'm ch challenging my lung capacity in doing that. Um, But it's also just like full body. And really like, it's <laughs> like, I just was laughing because I was like, Tell me that you've only snorkeled in Hawaii, that you're just, you're just like floating at the surface. And I'm like out there, like, <laughs> just like, and sometimes, oh God, we just had a, like a jellyfish episode where we were out with like three kids, me and my husband, and we had a paddle board because we have a toddler to like put them on. And um, yeah, we came across these relatives of box jellies and suddenly we were like in a, in just, you're in it and there's no you're not getting out of it. And we had to throw the kids up on a paddleboard. And like, we, we, I had to like, I was like paddling as hard as I could to like, get them out of here, like pulling these kids. So then this guy's like, Oh yeah, floating. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to snorkel like you're doing, but <laughs> I just bring this up because like that brings me joy that drops my cortisol. And it, I will always, it is like great movement. So Find things because so often people are like, you have to go to the gym. You have to lift weights. I, I hate going to the gym. 
I don't like being <laughs> around other people. I don't like when like men come up to me and talk to me about like what I, I don't want to be talked to. Like there's so yeah. much about the gym and this is a hotel gym. Then they do like a 5 a.m. Like nobody's there. <laughs> but otherwise I built a whole like workout area in my house with like free weights and everything. I'm like, I'm just going to, I have a Pilates reformer. I'm just like, I just do it myself because if I have to motivate to go to the gym, I won't. And honestly, I had meetings this morning and I had an hour between my meetings and getting on this podcast. And I was just like 30 minutes. I got 30 minutes to work out and go as hard as I can. And I will just take the shortest shower possible. But I'm like, if I don't do it in the morning, it's never going to happen. Because I'll tell myself end of day. And then five o'clock, I'm like, I'm not wearing a bra. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and your kids are like coming at you. Like I'm the same way. It's so funny. It's so, so true. I love that what you shared though, because I feel like when you said like, do it for your 60 year old self, I like literally visualize my mom, like playing with my kids and like, yeah. honest, like she's stronger than me because of like, she's just consistent with her movement. She's like, very like she's been at it for years and I think if people were to shift their perspective from that smaller is better like which is what society puts on us to how can I live longer and feel really good while doing it and it's like that's why you're snorkeling because you feel good while you're doing it it's like oh my gosh like that's how we stay consistent that's how we get to that place where it doesn't feel like work it just feels like I'm living my life and it's fun and it's, and it's helpful at the same time. So, yeah. Well, and the other thing, like, you know, you're saying your, your mom's in her sixties, like pickleball has taken off. Oh my God. Yes. That generation. And what I see is that people are now like, oh, I want to strengthen my shoulders because I want to protect them from injury. I want to make sure I want to hit the ball harder. I need to strengthen my legs because I want to protect my joints of my knees and ankles. And if you're not doing this, please do this. Uh, but also like I want to move faster. And that's the thing is when people have movement that they enjoy, they will start working out and training in a way like you can, you become more motivated to where you're like, I'm going to be better at my game. I'm going to smash that ball and <laughs> Janet from over, you know, around the block. She never going to see what's coming because I've been lifting. <laughs> Right. That's the truth. It's so true. It's like, it, it's fuel, it's momentum when you're actually enjoying it. So I love that. This has been so wonderful. And I feel like I could sit here and talk to you forever. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, about the books, everyone can get them. I know on Amazon, but is there anywhere else, like anything you want to pimp out, anything you want to share before? And I'll link everything in the show notes. <laughs> Yeah. So you can find the books, uh, everywhere that books are sold. You can also request them at your local library. I always think that's a nice gesture that. to make because it then makes it available to anyone else who maybe doesn't have the resources to buy the book and then it's there when they need it. So always call your local library and say, Hey, can you get this book in? Um, so, and yeah. And then if you're looking for any women owned and women formulated supplements for women, you can check out Dr. Brighton Essentials, which is DR Brighton is Brighton like the sun and essentials.com. And yeah. And then we're all over social media, me, Dr. Brighton, it's Dr. Jolene Brighton and then Dr. Brighton Essentials. Awesome. And then I will link that myo inositol supplement that you were specifically talking about for cravings. Cause I think that, and it's all, like you said, it's also something people use for PCOS um, in the show notes as well, because I know people will ask about that. But yeah. Dr. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. This was wonderful. Yeah. I hope this was helpful for everyone. And thank you so much for having me. I really hope that you enjoyed that episode. You can follow me on Instagram at wellness by Kelly or head over to our website, wellnessbykelly.com. Sign up now for the wellness by Kelly seven day free trial on our app or head over to our course and now get 20% off the course or 10% off of the membership with the code balancing chaos, all one word, B-A-L-A-N-C-I-N-G-C-H-A-O-S. In our course, you'll get access to an emailed lab review plus protocols built out to help you heal with whatever hormonal imbalance you're struggling with. With our membership, you'll receive a library of content with our app with low impact workouts, blood sugar balancing recipes, and mindfulness meditations, all designed to help you balance your hormones and help you feel like you are living your most beautiful, joyful, and vital life. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review. That is the best way to help the show grow and get to more listeners. We hope you enjoyed and I will see you next week.